So um, I'm Rachel Saunders. I am um, the brand new deputy director of the Institute of Business Ethics, which is very exciting. Um, this is um, my first kind of task really and my first kind of significant thing that I've I've done for the organization just last on Monday so very excited to to be here and to um to have a chance to to get to know um some of some of the people on 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 the event today um for anyone who's new to the IB um our purpose is to champion the highest standards of ethical behavior in business through advocacy training research and thought leadership and um, but also obviously um through convening events and, and networks to to share good practice and, and good ideas and, and to have discussions. So um, thank you all very, very much um, for, for being here and, and for being a part of it. Um, so in terms of um, housekeeping, um, we're keen to be really interactive. So please do type questions in the Q&A boxes as we go along. Um, I'll probably ask them for you rather than, unless there's something that's, I mean, if there sounds like there's a madly exciting story, then um, I might ask you to, to give more detail. But what I'll probably do is um, keep track of, of the questions myself and 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 ask them on, on your behalf when it makes sense in our discussions. So you can either put a question in the Q&A box or if somebody else has asked something that you think is really interesting, you'd also really like to make sure you get the answer to you. Um, um, then you can upvote it. So please do do that and definitely do that rather than asking the same or writing a question twice because um, I'll see the questions as they come through in order of what's been upvoted. So um, there's a little bit of democracy <laughs> as a part of this discussion as well. So if there's something really interesting that you'd like to be um, discussed, then use the function and upvote it. Um, we're recording the webinar and it'll be on our website and we are um live tweeting using the hashtags business ethics matters and um using the handle ibuk so um please do submit questions um use the chat function just for technical questions actual questions to simon um use the q a box um and yeah i think that is all the housekeeping i had to do so really excited um to be in conversation with simon financial today um many of you i'm sure have um, either met Simon or heard of him before, but he um, was a brilliant comedian, um, one of the founders of Stonewall, amongst other brilliant campaigning organisations, um, and now um, runs his own business, um, supporting senior leaders with diversity, and has a brilliant book, which I'm very, I'm really glad that Jen Smith has prompted me to read, and I hope that many of you um, will read it um, as well, and we'll be circulating that afterwards, called The, the Power of Difference. And um, I suppose actually the first question I might ask you, Simon, is one of the really interesting things I found um, in reading the book is that you're very open to challenging some of what we might see as very kind of established assumptions about what diversity is and, and what it means. So um, if I was from a business and I was looking for kind of the business, you know, what's the business case for, for diversity? Like why, why should it be something that my organisation invests in, considers, cares about, and particularly, you know, why I as an ethics practitioner ought to, to focus on diversity? What's the, I mean, kind of preparing people for the fact that we might have a quite challenging, interesting conversation. What is the actual kind of core nugget and kernel, which is actually non-negotiable? Like what, what should every business or any, any practitioner really be aware of and, and be committed to? Well, one of the things that has happened uh, as this, this, this idea of diversity and inclusion has blossomed in businesses is that, of course, it becomes kind of professionalised, but actually, I think, in possibly the wrong way. By that, I mean that it's easy, HR does it all sorts, and I'm sure it happens in the field of ethics, that it becomes a kind of process. And then what happens is there are certain elements to that process that everybody sort of assumes are part of it. So if you go to people's uh, uh, diversity, people say, you know, what are you doing? They'll say, well, you know, we've got unconscious bias training, we've got reverse mentoring, we've got this, we've got that, we've got the next thing. And so it becomes a series of, in a way, processes and, and frameworks and, and the danger of that is that, ironically, the notion of diversity, which is precisely about difference, it's a precisely about divergence, actually becomes a set of rules back which are really tools of conformity. So what I was trying to do in the book was start from one really simple question, but it's hard to answer. But my belief is that you don't get traction in your organisation unless you can answer this question, which is why 
are you pursuing diversity in the first place? And that answer comes in two big ways, really. The first is that we have a fundamental element of our human condition is that we're all different. We wouldn't be talking about diversity and inclusion unless we were actually different. So um, you can't see the world through somebody else's eyes. You can't walk in somebody else's shoes. You can't experience the world as somebody else experiences it. But what you can do is attempt to do all those things, but in the certain knowledge that you'll never succeed. And it's going through that process, understanding that you don't understand, which lies at the core of diversity. So there's a big kind of human challenge and condition, if you like, that lies at the heart of it. And in practical terms, what that means is that in your business or your organisation, what you need to understand is not just, you need to understand why you're pursuing diversity, but, but it's important to understand that in the specific of what you're trying to achieve so that what diversity becomes is the way in which you combine the different combinations that people can make and that's the existing people and how you can add to that to get the right combination of difference to achieve what it is you want to achieve a very simple example we were asked by an english language and literature department in a big university to help them diversify their staff. And I said to the head of the department, well, I'm not sure what question you're trying to answer because you've got brilliant staff, you've got great research, you've got terrific student entertainment, actually it's all going rather well. What problem are you trying to solve? And she said to me, it's very simply stated, there is great English literature being written in the world by people who are not English. I want to represent that in my staff. Now, that would look like ethnic diversity. It's not. It's cultural and geographic diversity. In other words, she was being very specific about exactly what she wanted to add to those academic staff and to the research and so on, because she felt that would allow and enable the students and the staff to investigate the English literature canon in a way that was much enriched. So at all points, I say to people, it doesn't matter whether you're in uh, uh, you know, financial services, wealth management, whether you're in engineering, whether whatever, whatever. There are always particular reasons why it is worth thinking about what is the combination difference. Take engineering as an example. I'm always saying to engineering companies, you really ought to actively seek out the experience of people who uh, have mobility problems and have sensory problems. Oh, I said problems. Yes, problems. It was sensory problems, mobility problems because their approach to the use of space, wholly different. But that will enrich your understanding of space for all of us. And the classic example of that will be uh, curb drops. You know curb drops on the edge of pavement? So these are the slopes that go down from the pavement to the street. They were originally uh, invented because uh, to help vets from the Second World War uh, move around more easily on uh, in, in, in training and campuses and so on and so forth. They were taken up by a wonderful, wonderful man at the University of Berkeley. And um, he became actually the father of independent living. But he, what he did was he campaigned for curb drops so that they could get around Berkeley campus much more easily. There were tiny numbers of people in Berkeley who were in wheelchairs. The, the proportion of people who use curb drops who are in wheelchairs actually is tiny. Everybody uses them, prams, you know, buggies, uh, wheelbarrows, bicycles, whatever. So that's a classic example of the way something very specific gave an insight into something much more general. So that's what the book's about, really. And it tells that story and provides practical examples by calling on personal stories, some of which are mine, some of which are people that I've encountered um, during my life, whose stories I think, I mean, uh, uh, that one from 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 Mr. Roberts, who was the the as I say the great disability campaigner, personal stories, political stories, and then trying to unpick diversity and absolutely finally to to sell it to people, if I can put it that way, in language which is understandable. In other words, part of the professionalization, the false professionalization, or the the wrong professionalization of it is that it's become a subject which is beset by a language which some people understand. And the effect of that, I think, is that diversity professionals or the activists then say, we understand this and we're going to, you know, educate you, we're going to teach you. That's very damaging because everybody actually has an understanding of what difference means because they're human.
yeah and we're all different yeah I think that's a really interesting point I suppose so kind of two questions flowing from that one is so say I'm an ethic practitioner an organization um I've heard it's been kind of an objective set for me by you know senior leadership that we have to do something about diversity and that you know the, the only driver I'm aware of at the moment that we're doing it is because um it's a reputation issue so maybe we're a very white or a very male organization whatever it is and, you know, somebody somewhere has decided that either for the sake of employee engagement or for the sake of our broader kind of public reputation, um, we need to, to do something. Um, what are the kind of the questions that I might either ask myself or ask my senior leaders in order to, to get underneath that a bit and, and get to those business drivers? How do I get from we should do something to actually the this is the, really the reason why, which then enables me to work out what my business drivers are? Yeah, well, there is certainly, I mean, compliance is certainly a catalyst. I mean, there's no doubt about it that, that, that setting an aspirational goal of the 30% club, uh, as the 30% club did in terms of women on boards, I mean, that, that, that catalyzed action because it became, it sort of reinvented shame, really. I mean, there were a couple of companies that had no women on their boards, and actually, in the end, people just looked at them slightly askance. So what I suppose I'm saying is that, that, that compliance is valuable, but it's not a core reason to do it. It might give you a business advantage if you're, you know, for instance, there are companies who put out procurement pitches. You won't get through the door if you don't have a diverse team. So it's a valuable lever. But your question was, you know, why should I do it fundamentally? And what should I, what, how should I do it? So I would say a couple of things about that. Firstly, it's important, I think, to separate out the notion of diversity deficits from the notion of diversity dividends. So when you construct your framework or your strategy for diversity, there will be imbalances in your, in your organization. And for various different reasons, you may wish to tackle those. So for instance, if you're, as we worked recently with a big NHS trust, actually in the region that, that they operate in, that is actually, the, they are the biggest employer, notwithstanding that there are two big motor manufacturers in the area, but they're still the biggest employer. So they have a kind of um, a civic responsibility about offering opportunities to people for work and training and so on and so forth. So they see that as part of the rationale for doing some, you know, their role as an anchor institution. And, and, and that will often be true of your company within your sector, within your town, within your office block, whatever it is. But it won't necessarily be the reason why you're trying to get more women or, 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 or alter that deficit. But the, foot, the, the, the problem with it is that if the policy is just based or the programme is just based on deficits, and that's where diversity in a sense started, didn't it? It started about notions of injustice and inequality and trying to write that. So there was a wrong to be righted. But if you just write your policy in terms of the deficits, you end up, which often happens, with me is that CEOs ring me up and they say, well, we must get more women. And I always say the same thing to them. I say, well, all right, let's pop out in the high street and get six assaulted. And they go, I don't mean that. I go, I know you don't mean that. But the point is women don't come as a job lot. So until you can explain to me <laughs> what a greater combination of men and women in your business department team is going to do to enhance your ability to achieve your goals, that's the diversity dividend. So my first suggestion is that when you do something about it, you separate the focus on the deficits and the dividend. Get the data for the deficits. Data is fundamentally important. It's important to understand both qualitatively and quantitatively where people are, how they feel, what they're doing. But the other bit is much more specific. That's the English language department bit. And I think when it comes to notions of ethics, again, you know, you could, if, if, if your reason for having an ethical framework is because you want to look good, you want to, you know, you want to protect your reputation, I would suggest that's not very ethical. In the same way that actually using diversity simply as a shield is actually not getting to the, the core of why you should do it. And in the end, actually, that will annoy people, that will alienate your staff because you won't be able to fulfill the aspirations you say you've got. So when you get your diversity framework, I call this the blah, blah, blah. People go, diversity is the right thing to do. We believe in, you know, people are our most important, blah, 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 blah. And actually then you look at their boards or their management and actually they're simply not living up to it. So don't false promise, get right down into the weeds. Yeah, and be clear and honest, I think that's, um, yeah, there, there's something about, you know, there, there's no point flumbling, like people can see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how you, you, know, too, you know, at no point saying, oh, right, you know, we're in engineering and we know that engineering is massively male. 
I mean, it, it, it's historically been so. So there's no point saying, right, you know, we're going to have 50, 50 men, women in our engineering department, you know, next week. Because actually, it's just not the pipeline. And all you're, what you're doing there is you're going to have to go and, I mean, I'm working with a big construction company at the moment. And the head of HR said to me, if we're going to achieve our targets, we're not going to have to get every single woman who works in construction to come and work for us. So happen. Yeah, you have to the talent pool somewhere. Yeah. So where does the problem sit? If you're mm. in an ethical situation, you know, you're an oil company and you want an ethical program, what do you do about Saudi? Yeah. You know, you, you can't ignore those material realities. You have to face up to them. Definitely. There's a really interesting um, point that's come through from Sarah, um, who has a background in engineering, and she, there's a really visual point she's made. Playing chess with black and white pieces versus playing with a colourful set of pieces will fetch the same game if the player's fundamentally the same. So what she, I think she's saying is, no matter who you are, if you have to conform to the same culture and the same ways of doing things, then you can't really make your 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 contribution. So how do you not just be diverse, but kind of value that diversity and, and, and make the most of it? What, what's the next step? Well, it's interesting. We were talking just before, and I'll, I think I'll repeat that point. So if you were to set about constructing your ethical framework. In order to do that, it, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm by no means a, an expert on this, but I am assuming that to get an ethical framework that's got some meaning to it in your company and has traction in your company and really affects the way people behave in your company and with clients, you have got to have a really thoroughgoing, uh, possibly difficult, absolutely rigorous discussion about what that means. So for instance, if you're operating abroad, we know the kind of conflicts that companies come up with around bribery. We worked with one of the drug companies that specializes in medicines around HIV and HEP, hepatitis. Their objective is to get their medication to people who really need it, who are typically underserved or hard to reach. That involves working in countries like Russia and those two diseases are particularly associated with gay men. And so therefore they are working with people in Russia who may well have deeply homophobic views, but they're doing it in order to get to the people. They themselves may be gay. That is a complicated moral framework. And in order to support your staff through that moral maze, if I can borrow the phrase, in order to do that, you've got to have a really rigorous discussion. So, how do you get to the point where we create what I call spaces that are safe for discussion, the disagreement, rather than from disagreement? So this notion of safe spaces is being ba badly misused at the moment. Safe spaces doesn't mean that you're not offended, that you don't disagree, that you're not upset, that, you're not, that you don't feel awkward. It means that when you do feel misunderstood, feel upset, feel awkward, actually that team, that culture supports you in so doing and encourages and creates a respectful dialogue with each other. So and, and Amy C. Edmondson's written a wonderful book called The Fearless Organization and it's about this notion of psychological safety and she gives lots of examples and it's the second best book that I'm going to recommend to you today. <laughs> Amy's, Amy's fantastic. I, I mean uh, I can't you know I can't hold her. <laughs> I, can't, I can't touch the outside of her intellectual tent. I mean she's truly brilliant. So what I'm saying is you have to try and firstly support your managers to value difference, to see it, value it and support it. So the exchange of difference, the, the interaction, the clashes, we've got to equip managers with the ability and confidence and emotional uh, intelligence to value conflict so that speaking is not speaking up or out, it's just speaking, you know. And that is difficult. I mean, you know, clashes are hard to deal with. And I'm speaking in a conference here, which is the university vice chancellors. And there is a huge argument about the exchange of ideas with students talking about feeling unsafe when people express certain views. But the acknowledgement has to be in a university that the exchange of ideas is primary. And to some extent, does it, everything have to be sacrificed to that aim? So what I was saying to them last night is you really have to support the managers to, to, to be able to deal with that. So I said, that's a number one thing. And a lot of that's about leadership. So I say to chief execs, you know, people put their value statements and they go, well, values are integrity, you know, communication, transparency. And you think, well, 
yeah, I mean, those are not values, those are givens. I mean, you know, if you don't have integrity at the half of your business, I'm not entirely sure what you're doing. I always say to people, number one value at the top of your business is we value good disagreement, right? That's the top. So I think it, it is a cultural question and it needs rigor. And so what you, what you do is you, you entertain that. And when things are difficult, you are able to deal with that. Your managers feel confident to deal with that. So you don't shut it down. You don't have an anxiety attack about it. You actually, in a sense, open it up, but work to give them the ability to contain it so it becomes productive challenge rather than negative. Definitely. Quite an interesting question here from Colin saying, as a gay disabled leader, always builds diverse team with a spectrum of ideas, but often felt a weird sense of guilt um, that you might exclude the white, straight, able bodied male. Like, is that something that Colin should feel guilty about? I suppose every perspective is important, isn't it? Well, one of the things that, that, that one of the sort of professionalized words that's arisen around diversity is this, this notion of allies, good allyship. I confess to hating this notion. I know what people mean. What they mean is that, you know, your white male apparently has lots of power and therefore, and, you know, statistically on, you know, on average data tell us that, you know, they have got, you know, we have got lots of power. But, but you know, I always feel like, you know, it's a bit, you know, gay allyship, you know, and as a gay man, I always think, that slightly feels like I'm being helped across the road by a burly heterosexual. <laughs> 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 it certainly feels that there's this kind of power imbalance, whereas actually, mm. I went to a conference once of a, a bunch of very annoying conference where people are on the you know, top floor of a building in Canary Wharf complaining about, you know, they're wearing suits that I can't afford, they've got jobs that get paid three times what I can earn in a, you know, three years, and they're complaining about being gay at work, and I go, shut up. But <laughs> this guy stood up, senior partner, big law firm, and talked about his alcoholism and his mental depression. White guy, middle-aged, married, kids. Well, you tell me, you know, are we really, you know, we did. So what I would say is that, that we're not in a sort of arithmetic here of, of yeah. you know, sort of oppression Olympics. What, what I would say is instead of allyship, what I would say is it's about recognizing everybody's difference. And the key thing about difference, it's not who you are, white bloke, white woman, gay man, whatever. It's not about who you are. It's what you bring through who you are. So, what you need to be curious about, and so I would say, don't feel guilty about it, be curious, I would say, about what that guy's story is, because you will find both of you have got differences. So I often do an exercise, but I always do an exercise at the beginning of sessions, and I said, well, we put them in pairs, and we go, find three differences, with your background, your upbringing, whatever, that affect who you are and how you work. But as soon as you find similarities, scoot over them. I'm not interested in similarity. And by the way, I'm not interested in differences. I support whilst well, Northeast Sports Liverpool. Not interested in that either. Real differences, you know, because that's where the excitement starts. So I would say to the person who asked the question, uh, was it Alan, I think? Was, was, I think it was Colin. Colin, sorry. I would say, Colin, be curious about the guy you're talking about, and he must be curious about you. And crucially, not make assumptions, just because I think you said, uh, you know, if you're disabled and he's not, well, okay. But nonetheless, back to my example of your, your alcoholic and, and uh, with depression, you can't see that, but you can hear about it. Yeah. But I think it's, it's this curiosity of exploring everybody's difference. And, and it's not allyship. It's actually the recognition that everybody's got a different story to tell. And yes, of course, there's group power. We, we understand that, but we have to understand both group and individual. And do you think it's worth recognizing? So I think a lot of people probably um, use the kind of Equality Act protected characteristics as a, the framework for thinking about, about diversity. Um, but what we're starting to touch on is actually it's much broader than that, like the difference that people can bring, you know, when they turn up at work or, or more broadly, um, can be all sorts of things about their knowledge, their understanding, their background. How, um, how, how kind of broad, I suppose, the question I'm asking is partly how broad should, should we be going in thinking about diversity of views and opinion and, and background and experience and how if, if we're saying very broad and actually everything is important in terms of who you are and what you believe in and and, and where you're from and, and what you're about then how do we make that manageable in terms of something that you know a business can yeah. really value and, and think about? Well I think there are two um, that, there's two questions in there for me the one I think is these big groups, women, I mentioned LGBT, BAME, 
uh, there's a lovely conference which was in 2020 or 2019 called hashtag BAME over. Great pun. But what they were saying was really simple. They were saying, look here, BAME means don't, don't crush us into this acronym because we are different. We have different provenance, geographical, cultural, religious, our families, where we live, how we live, it, it, all that stuff. We, there's a, that's a ridiculous category to try and um, uh, 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 make a single coherent, of which to make a single coherent group. However, all of those people understand what racism means. So when you use those groups, be really clear about what it is you're trying to describe when you use that big catch-all group. So it's perfectly acceptable to say, because the data tell us, women experience as a group disadvantage in promotion in certain sectors in British industry. The data is really clear, and that is for women, you know, and that's one of the problems I have with the LGBT acronym, and I always say LGBT anti, is because actually, if you look at the discrimination that lesbians and gays experience, it's, it's actually fundamentally different in character uh, between, uh, uh, you know, when you're talking about the policies that you need to bring. But on the other hand, you know, when people are gender non-conforming, you know, a fist in the face is, is because, and I'm going to use, you know, a, a pejorative words, it's because you're a puff or a lesser. I mean, you know, that's why they hit you. Prejudice is pretty damn stupid. So, so the first thing I would say is that, that back to this deficit dividend thing, be really clear about why you're using what acronym to describe what group. You know, be really clear about that and don't use it to describe things like, oh, let's, because otherwise you're back in the 50s, aren't you? you say, oh, let's get a woman's point of view, you know. So that's one thing about the, you know, the difference between the group and the individual, because within that, those groups, A, they have different stories. They also have different views, by the way. I mean, I haven't spent since, you know, the 70s fighting for gay equality for us to be treated as if we're all the same. The whole point of getting some equality was to be different so that we could be who we were as individuals. So you've got to balance this, this idea of when you're using the group to describe something and how you're encountering the particular individual. Second point I would make is this. The thing about being at work, I mean, you're just a group of strangers, aren't you? You're, you're randomly put together in this place and you're told, well, you know, go produce oil or go and manage wealth or go and make toothpaste or whatever the hell it is. It's random. The only thing you've got in common is the objective, the business objective. That's what you've got in common. So the question then becomes, what does each one of you bring? that enables you to reach that business objective. So people talk about bringing your whole self to work, and it's a terrible phrase, because God forbid. I mean, it's not the pub, you know, it's work. So, but bring your whole self to work is interesting, because that's about what is it in my story that can combine with what she's got in her story, or he's got in his story, to achieve the objective. And that collaboration is based on difference. It's not based on similarity. The similarity is the objective. That's the common agreement. The collaboration is based on difference. So if you're on the call, just think to yourself around the team that you work in and think, who do I rely on in that team and for what? Because you know. Absolutely. Who haven't I got that I wish was here? You know that too. So creating those teams of difference is fundamental to your ability to achieve those things. So you're always dealing here with people's individual contributions. And then on the bias, discrimination, prejudice end of the market, you're looking at the overall group experience, which is often quite limited in terms of what's shared. Yeah. Something I thought was really interesting in the book um, was some of the truth and reconciliation work that you talk about um, and about how there are people who can have done terrible, terrible things and that will almost always, in some ways, define them. Um, but actually, they are always more complex than that and you know of course we're people and you know we're none of us would want ever want to be only you know defined by by the worst thing that we, we've ever done do you think you could um talk a bit more about that and reflect on um how that informs your thinking around diversity and equality yes where i where it really resonates for me is in this notion of total agreement so when i talk about collaborating through difference in in, in pursuit of a common aim. What that means, I think, is that you need to be able to get on with each other. You don't actually have to like the people you work with. It's, it's handy not to dislike them. 
<laughs> you know, and it's very handy not to think they're appalling. But by and large, the liking them, the agreeing with them about other issues is, is by and large not the point until, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, if you're black and somebody's racist, then clearly that's beyond, you know. But by and large, actually, the notion of total agreement is not what's required. And one of the dangers, I think, in political and social media at the moment, in the political atmosphere, is that there's a kind of weird demand at the moment for total agreement. So where I find that the, the, a lot of the Truth and Reconciliation stuff and the Forgiveness Project, which I've been a patron of for years and years, is wonderful. If you're having a crappy day, just go and look on the Forgiveness Project and read some of the stories. It'll just lift your spirits. But you can't agree, for instance, about a murder. So if you take the 1984, the Brighton bomb, which was planted by Patrick McGee as a member of the IRA, and it killed the father of somebody called Joe Berry. He was called Sir Anthony Berry. And when that happened, Joe was determined to find out why her father died. She wanted to know that it just wasn't pointless. So she went to Northern Ireland and she talked to people and she listened to people and she made it absolutely known that she wanted to find out what was happening and uh, then long story but uh, Patrick McGee was then arrested then he was imprisoned he was given a series of life sentences and then he was released as a political prisoner in uh, 1997 as part of the Good Friday Agreement and Joe made it very clear that she wanted to speak with him they did eventually meet in private and 20 years after the bomb 2004 they asked I've known Joe for a long time they asked me to moderate a conversation between them in public for the first time what is extraordinary about that conversation is a number of things Joe uh, Patrick doesn't apologize. Patrick says, this was an, a, a justifiable military action. We saw no alternative but violence. And that's why we did it. For Joe, she says that's the most difficult thing she has to hear because she doesn't believe that violence ever achieves anything. She finds that really, really difficult to hear. Patrick also says though, and I think it's quite powerful he doesn't apologize because he also then says, but I have to take responsibility. And when I look at Joe, I see somebody to whom I have caused the most unimaginable grief and pain and loss. And also when I look at Jo, I have to realize that her father must have been a great bloke because he produced her as a daughter. Now that's profoundly moving. And if you, if you read the transcript of the conversation we had, the word here crops up again and again and again. So where I find this inspiring is that there's, you can't agree, but what you can do is listen and find a way forward together. Even if you don't forgive them, I don't, the forgiveness project is great, it's more of a question than a, it's certainly not an obligation. Even if you don't forgive them, and say, well, you know, no, never, I mean, forgiveness is not about like, never mind. It's about finding a way forward. So if you transfer that into work, we've got to be really careful, I think, about, about rejecting people wholesale because of one or two things about them with which we do not agree. Because that's not how collaboration works. So if we go back to my Stonewall experiences when we started there, the way we achieved change in Stonewall was building big alliances with people with whom we didn't necessarily agree about everything. So classically Catholics, we had a whole bunch of religious allies. Now, there's a section of the Catholic church who take what my father used to call a rather dim view of homosexuality. But you don't want, if you, if you try, and, try and tell them it's a virtue, you're not going to get anywhere. But if you say to a Catholic in Belfast or Glasgow, you know what it's like to be discriminated as a group because you're a member of that group, they get that. And they know that's wrong. And so they understand your experience. So they'll ally with you. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do is cut through this requirement for total agreement and say that the way we achieve change is by agreeing uh, to collaborate around our differences, around are common objectives that we can find, not total agreement. And anybody who's in a relationship will know that's true. Otherwise, you could never decide what movie to go and see. <laughs> There's quite a, a practical question connected to this that someone's asked, which is to what extent should a manager intervene in social relations between their staff? So, for example, if a member of staff is excluded from social occasions, and is that something that a manager should get involved in? And if so, how should, how should they approach it? I heard one recently, actually, it's very common, this. You suddenly find that, that I heard one where, where, where there was a bunch of people, somebody came new into the team. As it happened, he was Asian background, as it happened, he was a Muslim. Um, but they all used to go to the pub and they just never asked him. But as it happened, he also lived 15 miles away and none of them did. 
And the excuse was, oh, we didn't think he wanted to go to the pub. And you go, okay, hang on a second. What are you, what do you do? If you're just a bunch of mates going to the pub, that is one thing. But actually the fact that it's everybody in the team and not one of them. I mean, clearly that has a damaging effect. It's horrible to be in that position. I mean, it's that, you know, you, everybody knows that's playground. So I think actually managers need to say to that group of people, look, we need to be clear about what you're doing here and whether that's what we also need to be clear about. And I don't know what this guy's name was. So, you know, let's call him Ahmed or whatever. Um, sorry, I don't mean to be stereotypical. I'm just trying to pick a name. But let's actually ask Ahmed what he wants and whether he wants to be involved in these things. And actually, if you went to a restaurant where there was alcohol, but there was a non-alcoholist food, would he feel more comfortable there? So could you go there and blah, 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 blah. Yes, I think managers really ought to do that. And the reason they ought to do it is that that is affecting the operation of the team. It's not genuinely understanding the differences within the team. So he's added a new difference. And actually the team then has to adapt the way it works in order to accommodate and embrace that difference. So I, intervention's really difficult because I used to think when I started doing all this that you should intervene immediately on the spot. The more I hear people's stories, the more I realize that's not the case. Sometimes it's absolutely crucial to intervene. A very good example, I think, is when, um, you know, you, Rachel, you know, you say, oh, I've got a really good idea at the meeting. And you say, I think we should do blah, blah, blah. And then a couple of times, after a couple of contributions, I say exactly the same idea. And everybody then refers to it as Simon's idea. It's a classic between men and women. I think it's great if the chair of the meeting says, actually, I'm going to call that Rachel's idea because she said it first. Now, that can be a bit awkward, but it's really worth doing because it just makes the point and do it in a jolly way or whatever. Sometimes you want you need to intervene. Other times, that immediate intervention can end up with a person who is the object of the difficulty feeling even more vulnerable. I've so often known groups of women who'll do that with each other. So it's not as the chair might feel a bit heavy handed. But, you know, if if, yeah. if 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 you're listening out for each other and somebody says, oh, yeah, Rachel said that two minutes ago, didn't she, yeah. Simon? You know, what a great idea that, that Simon's supporting Rachel's idea. So it's sometimes supporting <laughs> each other and being aware Absolutely of it right. amongst the room. So it's not always left to the leader to, to do often, that. Well. You know, you're in a, I went the other day, there was a bit. So three people were at a conference, a woman and two men. A an internal conference and there was this guy there who's a senior manager who just was making so stupid sexist remarks the whole time about women love chocolate and all this nonsense and nobody spoke up and so when she got back at the car at the end of the day with these two men she was like what, I, what? why didn't you speak up and they went oh my no what a he was you know blah 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 and she said, well, why didn't you say something she felt completely unable to say something and actually, but the trouble was also, he was a very senior manager. Doesn't stop being an idiot, as it turns out, but you know. So I think it's a really difficult, con but I think the way to think about it is that why are you intervening? So I'm intervening as a manager because this is the team that I manage and actually it's misfunctioning. So what I'm trying to sort out here is a dysfunction in the way the team works. Whereas I think if you get into I don't agree with this, my values are different. Then I think you get complicated. I think of language and behavior in terms of three broad groups, careless, thoughtless, and malicious. Careless is, I think, the difference between careless and thoughtless is a of degree, really. Um, I did a stupid thing the other day. I said, <laughs> I said the British, I said the bacon sandwich, I said the great British snack, everybody can eat the bacon sandwich. The bloke in a yamok could put his hand up in the front row and well, actually not me. And it was funny and silly, and he was taken with Michael, and it was all fine. And but but and malicious, that's it, that's process. So when the manager sees something that they think is malicious, then I think then you have to go to process actually, and you have to take evidence and you have to whatever. It's the bit in the middle, the thoughtless stuff, where where, where intention doesn't match effect. That's where it gets difficult. But crucially, as a manager, you've got to try and create dialogue in that situation, not enmity. If everybody just stands in the opposite corner of the room and points the finger, you, no one learns. So it's a delicate task. It's, it's, look, I, I think managers are extraordinarily good managers. Absolutely extraordinary because, yeah. you know, doing that's very delicate stuff. 
Yeah. Is that helpful? I don't know. I, I think it is. I think it is. Um, Giselle Brown has a question which sounds like it might be based in some slightly challenging lived experience, which is, um, how do you respectfully advise your manager that they should undertake formal training to deepen their understanding as opposed to just attending free webinars to spew the latest buzzwords? And I think that is a, a challenge because, yeah, you as, as a manager, you feel oh. like you've you've taken a step back. It's, it's the difference between intent and impact, isn't it? You're sort of, you started trying to, to use some of this language and to, to to open up issues, but actually your your understanding isn't deep enough and that's having um, uh, an impact on, on, on some of your teams. So how can you as a team member kind of reflect back to your manager that actually they maybe haven't grasped everything that they need to grasp? Well, I guess this is... <laughs> Depends slightly on their character, your character. I suppose the tactful way of saying it is, um, in your appraisal or whatever, you say, you remember when that happened to somebody else or to me, whatever it was. You remember when that happened. I'd like you and I to have a conversation about that because I don't think actually that worked out as well as it could have done. And I think we all need... I think there are things that I know that might help you, and I'd be interested to know why you dealt with it in that way. I think that's the thing. I think the worst thing to do is to point at the manager and say, in a sort of snotty voice, you've got to educate yourself. And that's back to my original point. The whole point about this is that, you know, being human means that you, you, you mess up. This is not occasional. This is not accidental. This is fundamental. We, we don't understand each other. I do not know. I could say something that profoundly upsets you or offends you and I have no idea that I've done it because I've been thoughtless and it might be something you are bringing up or whatever so I think you have to approach it carefully but again approach it in such a way that says I'm doing this not to make a value judgment about you as a human being but to say I think as a team as a group as a function as a project I think we're going to benefit from this so you know work is about the objectives it's, there's a terrible narcissism that, that it's all about me. You know, people, people you know, I, I this working from home. So I was doing thing the other day and uh, the person who runs this department said they will bring up the working from home thing because at the moment they're obsessed with it. It was nothing to do with what we were doing, by the way. And they had spent the whole morning, we've been talking about collaboration, teamwork, project work, diversity, how we collaborate more, da, 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 da. And then sure enough, a bit later in the day, they all said, we want to work from home. And I said, well, that's interesting for two reasons. Number one, you spent the morning talking about how you want to meet up with each other more. So that's not going to achieve by working from home. But the second thing is, I'm not sure I want for, plays a very significant role in people working. I want. No, it turns out I want. No, does working at home enable me to do the job, that, by the way, you are paying me to do? Now, I know that sounds pretty sort of, you know, a bit finger waggy. Actually, that is work. You know, work is not about, oh, you know, it's not a consumable that's part of your basket that goes along with yoga and, you know, uh, uh, your two yearly visit to an ashram and your, etc. That's not work. Work is actually rather functional. So I think that we've got to not just put our own wishes out there, our own well-being, if you like, out there. We're actually about how we all work better together. So I think that would be a way to approach the manager. I mean, the trouble is, if he's a complete dork, and, and or she's a complete dork on or they're bullying or something uh, then you've got a rather different situation you've actually just got to say actually that in my view was really bad behavior but i still think it's worth saying it's bad behavior because it doesn't help the team to work well together yeah absolutely yeah no there's that and it's that really important distinction which i think you've you've flicked on a bit which is um, the difference between someone who's offensive or malicious or uses language which is just wrong and inappropriate and the difference between that person and the person who is sort of trying to think about it, hasn't quite grasped it, yeah. and, and and needs a nudge. Oh, well, I mean, you know, let's be honest. I wrote, I've only written two books in my life. I wrote one about manners, and I want to run about how you're not supposed to convince everybody that you're right and go on and on and on until they agree with you. It turns out both of my books are notes to self. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in other words, I'm not, I didn't write this book because I know it all. I wrote this book precisely because I don't know it all and precisely because we make mistakes. I think, you know, that's quite fundamental. And if you think back to this notion of ethics again, is that, and I, I was saying to you earlier on, every time I say the word ethics, I can't stop thinking. There is a wonderful website that's actually called Ethics Girls. And it's a fashion and makeup website that's now expanded into sustainable living. And I just think it's great fun. But if you think about ethics, 
constructing an ethical framework is not about constructing, it's not about imposing your individual values on everybody else. That's not what it's about at all. An ethical framework is precisely a shared way of living, isn't it? It's precisely about reaching a shared framework that you think is principled, encompasses and within which you can live and by which you can live. And therefore, by necessity, you will agree. So it's yeah. precisely not about your individual thinking. It's precisely about how your individual thinking contributes to a collective agreement. Yeah. Karine has um, given us a question, which is about the difference between a diverse team where everyone's accepted, which is your kind of baseline, I suppose, um, and using that diversity as an enabler, thus using diverse opinions to create a better organisation. Mm. I think you already touched on that with your um, English literature example. Um, are there other examples of where people with diverse views and perspectives can, can contribute to, to making a better organisation as a whole? Yes, I'm, I'm not a great fan of the phrase business case. And the reason is that I don't think this notion of difference and the combination of difference sits somewhere above you know, the business case feels to me like an add-on. You know, it's kind of something you sort of, you know, it's your backpack. You know, you've got you and then you've got this backpack. The point about my approach would be to say that actually this, this valuing of difference, that's fundamental, that's a given. Put any three of us in the room together, there's difference. So this thing about valuing the difference is fundamental to how we get on together. So what I would say is that that, 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 is, that is the... That is, the, uh, that is the basis on which we can work together. So I, and I think from that flows dividends if you recognize that consciously. So, and what I would say, everybody's got that difference to bring. So I think what's lying behind the question though is that when you're, people can be physically present, but they need to be, if you like, spiritually, emotionally, in that way present. But that comes from the person who's brought them together, that's the leader, the manager, that comes from them making it really clear that they absolutely require everybody to listen, to be curious and to value people's opinions. That doesn't mean to say you value them equally in terms of not who they are, but in terms of what they say. People say stupid things. We all do. People say things, really? Fine. But just, I mean, don't sneer at them just don't agree with it or whatever but value the fact that they've brought it you know and and so i would not make the difference which i think people do between somehow the business case and then personal well-being and i think to me that's an integrated idea that it stems from this human condition of being different and it's out of that that we learn to do things better together yeah and if you're trying to build that that kind of very open culture where people can bring what they genuinely think and believe like how because, I mean, there, there are two risks. One is that some people will be more um, open than others. So, so you know, how do you, how do you make the most of, um, of people who don't necessarily want to turn on their life story or, you know, their identity or, you know, like how, how, how do you make the most of people for whom, yeah, I'll, I won't ask that. I'll, I'll save the second question. I'll stick with that one. So, so if you want to build an organisational culture, which is based on valuing difference, but it's clear that some people... A very out I know that's a very LGBT word but you know out in whoever they are and whatever they are and they're bringing that difference to work and they're you know enjoying talking about their culture or their background or you know whatever it is and there are then there are others maybe in particular teams or you know who, who maybe um just because of, of who they are are just less open yeah. how do you how are you proactive in in drawing well, the first, so that everyone feels I think happy? the first thing is that you know, if you're really going to value difference that's a difference you need to value in that particular person if they've got a very um strict boundary between the home life and the personal life um my husband has that he 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 it's partly cultural and nigerian he finds it extraordinary that Europeans exchange all these personal details about each other. He just thinks that's bizarre. You know why you do it? He just does not want that at work. So if he were involved in that sort of thing, he would he would say, actually, I've got a bit of a boundary here. And I remember when I did that that in pairs find differences exercise, some guy saying, I've got a very strict boundary. I don't like to share those things. And so I just want to say that. Well, you know tons about how to work with that person you know and you need to respect those boundaries what was interesting was as the day went by because people respected his boundaries he started to feel more confident about opening up so that was nice but in other words if you value difference you've got to value difference 
there's no obligation here. This whole thing is not about, oh, you've got to value difference, but do it in this way, because that'd be conformity again. So, so what, you, what, what you've got to do is respect people's boundaries, but then you've also got to show them the kind of curiosity that will give them the confidence for them to tell you a bit more about themselves. Because it does help to know that when you work with people. It really does. But sometimes, you know, if somebody doesn't want to be out at work, that doesn't necessarily mean to say they think it's really homophobic at work and they don't want to tell you. And it might not mean that they're really kind of shy and retiring and actually they haven't come to terms with their own sexual orientation. It might mean none of those things. It might mean they just don't want to share that kind of bit of their life at work. End of. Yeah. Respect that boundary, you know. Yeah. And if you're a manager and you find yourself in a situation where um there are issues of disagreement, so maybe somebody with a religious point of view about someone's sexuality, or um there's quite an active debate in society at the moment about gender identity and you know what it means, and people might work alongside each other who feel quite differently about an issue like that. Um, would you as a manager try to neutralize that and kind of calm things down and say you know it's a, we don't need to worry about that too much in the workplace let's just be respectful of each other and professional or would you seek to to have those those conversations and 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 find a way through i think it really depends on the context so if you look at these questions of gender identity in where i am here at the university of uk the the, the, the conference of vice chancellors it feels it is wrong in terms of the core purpose of a university to say that certain well-researched and underpinned views are discounted merely because they are that category of view. And we've had a number of high profile examples recently where academics, um, famously Kathleen Stock at Sussex, where academics were, you know, literally they, 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 were, they ended up having to leave the institution despite the fact that what they'd done was published and researched a perfectly valid, well-researched and importantly, lawful point of view. So on one hand, I think where the exchange of ideas and intellectual ideas is fundamental to what you're doing, then actually the manager has to be empowered to make those things happen. I think it's slightly different in a situation where people decide they want to have a debate about you know, race or gender identity or whatever. And then you have to say to yourself, well, how much is that core to what we're trying to do? And back to that point, one of the difficulties is this idea that people at the moment are getting into the habit of regarding disagreement as enmity. So the idea, if I say, I believe that actually the biology of this situation is really clear, there are two sexes. Then I say, I always divide, things, I divide loads of things into three, but here's another three for you. Biology law and policy, social interaction. Now, my mate Jackie Gavin, a trans woman of, I don't know how long, 25, 30 years, whatever, she was called Scott before she was Jackie. Now, Jackie and I did a panel together once, and I did my bit, she did her bit, we chatted together because we were interested in each other, we threw it open, woman in the front row, got into a complete fit about, oh my God, all this misgendering, blah, 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 I don't know what to do, I work in HR. Jackie used very funny Glaswegian, leg forward, she went, well, the first thing, dear, is calm down. <laughs> she said, then just ask. And she was really funny. And then she said this extraordinary thing. She said, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Scott's bravery. I carry Scott with me everywhere I go, he's part of me. And the, the, the degree of relief and, and empathy in the room was absolutely extraordinary because what, what Jackie does is tell her story. Now you'll notice I call her her. It would not occur to me not to call Jackie her. So I think there's a difference between, but Jackie would also say that she's biologically a male. And she's very clear about the fact that she's trans. There's a movement there. So it, it's very complicated, by the way. So I think there's something about social, uh, in that particular case, this is that example, social, law and policy, and 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 um, and uh, 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 biology. There are moments when that argument matters and moments when it doesn't. So in the health service, it matters because actually women often, uh, that the, the women's sex matters to their health. And it matters to the services that are provided, the way they're provided. Women demonstrate heart attacks in a wholly different way from men. The research tells us that women's pain is discounted in a wholly different way, blah, blah, blah. There's lots of stuff. 
female genital mutilation only happens to women. And so it goes on. So there are way, places where sex matters, but there are also places where gender matters, where people's presentation and how they are in the world matters. What am I saying? I'm saying this is fraught at the moment. I'm saying that actually what happens is if you say, I think that sex is immutable and you cannot change sex, what will happen is there is a small group of people who will point at you and tell you you're a fascist or transphobic or whatever it is. That is unhelpful. And I think it's up to managers to say, hang on a second. It is unhelpful to accuse people when they hold a view that's sustainable and supportive. So the question then becomes, why are we talking about this? How can we talk about it? And I think often you may want to say as a manager, okay, I understand that the two of you have fundamentally different views about this. However, I'm going to ask you not to bring that subject to work. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you, by the way, let's agree that you, who is presenting as a woman, let's agree how we're going to address you. And I'm going to ask you on the other side, yeah, I'm going to ask you to go along with that because I think that's going to help the team to flourish. But I'm not going to impose that on you. I'm going to see if we can reach an agreement. Now, that's really tough. And it takes time. And in, um, I, mean, I had a really interesting group work, work, working with recently where a similar accusation of racism happened. And the manager was brilliant. He created dialogue where actually they managed to take the temperature down and they managed to understand each other. This is because we're human. Yeah. That's the that, problem. And I think that's such an important point in what you said, which is why are we having this conversation? And it can be because sex and gender or race or whatever are relevant in the services we're providing or in how we communicate about what we do you know health, health service being a great example in which case we need to think of it through that lens of how can we provide the best possible service um but it may be that we're just talking about it because we were chatting at lunchtime one day and we got onto it and we you know we we we, we aren't quite sure how to resolve it and in that situation you need to resolve it in the way that's mm. best for the team I have worked with many people who do not approve of homosexuality. I've worked with many of them. And so, frankly, I get on and see what I can work with them on, rather than finding the disagreement. And that's really big of you, though, isn't it? And that's asking a lot of people. It's bigger them, too. I mean, you know, it's bigger both sides. I mean, you yeah. know, and it's, and it's proper. That, that's, that's what you should do. You can't enforce people. To believe something that you believe, but it's quite so what you do is you find out how you believe to somebody who who disagrees with you. Like that's quite a big deal. It, yeah, it is, but you know what? It's it's um, it's quite satisfying <laughs> because, because because you're achieving something together. Um, recognizing that you have a very different approach to life and the world, and actually, that's quite interesting. Yeah, that's challenging, you know. And I'm not good at it, by the way. Yeah. I just had a steaming argument with somebody out there with whom I have a furious disagreement to have. I think he's doing completely the wrong things in this institution. But nonetheless, I learned a lot from the conversation, even though I might not have looked or sounded like I could, but I did. You learned and you listened. But that's different, because that's a, I mean, you can, you can have a discussion about a decision he's made, but, but if he said, well, actually, I think that your sexuality is just wrong and I'm disgusted by it, it's something that's, you know... Something well, I always say the same thing when people say that, sort of, don't sleep with me, then. <laughs> it's not compulsory it's not compulsory yeah. it's just i want to do it <laughs> yeah but it comes down to actually it really doesn't matter because what we're doing here is working on whatever it is and you know but, but yeah. it's such that i mean maybe this is something to as a reflection because um it's 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 such a complex balancing act isn't it between asking people to bring that you know the, not the whole self i agree with you that phrase is a difficult one but you know we, we want to value diversity and make the most of it because it brings with it a difference in ideas and and knowledge and understanding and perspective which is so valuable um but how you at the same time kind of say actually there are some contexts and places where we might just have to draw a line and you know i might understand that that's an aspect of my life that i might not talk about well i would argue time. you see that's the recognition of diversity and difference Mm. You can't you can't pretend there's no difference. There is. Somebody thinks mm. Y, somebody thinks X. Somebody is Y, somebody is X. So the value of diversity is the recognition that that, that, that difference exists and then working together to find out, well, then being with each other to find out how you can work together and 
in pursuit of a common aim. That's diversity. The imposition of rules is conformity. Yeah. And how on earth, okay, so having really started to go to, to some quite challenging and complex areas, I think, and I think it's really, and thank you for being so open and enabling us to do that based on both your own experience and, and the, the conversations you've had with so many others. But um, kind of zooming right back out again, I'm, um, I'm on the board of a big corporate. Um, somebody said to me that one of the responsibilities I'm now gonna take on is, is diversity. And I am really excited about that because I understand how important it is. And, you know, I have got some experience and training and it's something I've spent some time on. Um, but how do I, as somebody who maybe is there for two days a month, um, you know, not able to really get it deep into the weeds of the culture of the organisation, how do I make sure that I'm getting the information insights that I need in order to be confident that this is an organisation where people can have the maturity and mutual respect to be having these sorts of conversations. Really be clear that the d groups of people don't hold the same opinion. So the controversy over the Sewell report, which was the, the commission, the government, uh, uh, which said, you know, there is no institutional racism in Britain, blah, blah, blah. There were, nine, there were 10 commissioners, nine of whom were not white, one of whom was white. And what happened when that report came out is that another group of people, many of whom were black and Asian, criticised the report. But what they did was they have, a lot of people said, well, they're not the right kind of black people because they didn't come up with the kind of conclusion that we agree with. So I would say, no, there aren't any wrong kinds of gays, there aren't any wrong kinds of black people. The whole point about diversity is that actually you are able to hold the opinions you hold. Now, you might say to the government, actually, we could have had more diversity of opinion in there. I wasn't in the commission meetings. But, but the point about that is that there is a vibrant argument around the significance of race in life, in the life of black people, in the life of white people. There's a really big argument there about that. So, and so what I'm saying is you're the chief, you know, you're on the board there. You've been given this responsibility for, for that. So therefore, entertain that disagreement in pursuit of what the company is doing. So say to the people who are involved in diversity, this is all about achieving our common aims. This is all about how we can find difference, how we create a talent strategy to draw on people's difference in order to achieve those common aims. And you're always saying, I will value difference. I'm not after a single point of view here. I am after a multitude of views because that's how we're going to get, give you the platform to be, to bring yourself who you are to work and to the achievement of those objectives. So I think you you state from the outset that actually you're not interested in conformity, you're interested in difference. And that stops you going down the sort of TikTok route of diversity. It's yeah. more complicated, it's much more fun, by the way. Yeah, more fun and harder, but yeah, take it takes time, but it's worth it, I think, rather than asking for a dashboard of metrics. But then I suppose that'd be, I mean, I feel like it's maybe too easy to kind of diss that. Like you said at the beginning, data is really important. Like well, data is really important, but it's important to understand with all data what it's actually telling you. And what it tells you is it might tell you something about the group experience. If you collect data about group X, 16 to 25 year olds, it turns out that they spend this amount of time on screens. They use it for this, that and that and that. Fine. But that doesn't tell you about the individual aspirations and life stories of every single 16 to 25 year old. So you've got to, you've got to balance the, the group data with an understanding of individual stories. And, and that's the point is that we're not, those, those, those groups, they, they, they describe certain aspects of our experience, but they don't define us. Amazing. I think that is, we're a few minutes finishing, but actually I think that's such a powerful um, concept to end on. The, the idea that, yeah, group experiences are important and they don't define us and and that if that's that's such a, a complex but important balance to to managing all the time thank you so much simon is there anything thank else you. that you'd like to end with or, or conclude with to share any final well thoughts? obviously you know i'd like to do a song but there's no piano here <laughs> and uh, and i've got that a ter does. terrible singing <laughs> voice so so one way or another no just to say thank you very much indeed and to say I hope people get something out of the book. Do get in touch if any of this stuff uh, resonates with you in your organization. And if you want to talk further, or I'd be really interested to talk to you about the relationship between your ethical framework and the diversity work. I think that's something I don't know uh, enough about. I would love to hear more. So do just get in touch. I'm sure that um, that, that Alex and, uh, and Rachel can um, send my details around. So just drop me an email and let's have a further chat. That would be lovely.
We'd love to. Amazing. Thank you so much.